I want to start this morning by sharing a small piece of Ikar's origin story with you. So you know that Ikar was established as a community that would stand at the intersection of spiritual and religious practice and social justice, work to try to transform our community and our society and the world for the greater good. And when we started the community, we very quickly launched a kind of traditional organizing model, one that would organize our community around the core question of what keeps you up at night. But I had this aching sense right from the beginning that something wasn't right in the way that we were um, bringing this organizing practice into the community. And I spent a lot of time worrying and thinking about it, and I ultimately realized that it wasn't actually the right organizing question for us. Instead of asking us what terrifies you, we should be asking what inspires you. What are your dreams? What kind of world do you imagine might be possible? So instead of asking what keeps you up at night, we shifted to asking what gets you out of bed in the morning? And with Brooke Wirtschafter, our incredible director of community organizing, who started actually just as a lead volunteer before she officially joined the team, and our incredible leadership, Minyan Sedek leadership, we have spent many years organizing around hope and not around fear, around love and not around hatred. And I've been thinking about this for the past many days because... The fact is that as much as I am driven by what gets you out of bed in the morning, unfortunately, there is just a lot that is keeping me up at night. And I've been remembering a conversation that I had with a beloved community member, a writer, just as I set out to start to write my manuscript project book. And... And I remember that the writer, the writer and I were talking about how debilitating fear can be in the writing process. And she shared a lesson that her beloved grandmother had taught her, which is this. You can't escape the darkness. So what you have to do is acknowledge it, even articulate it in a place where it's safe to do so, say it out loud, and then say, thank you, darkness, I won't be needing you anymore this afternoon because I have work to do and you'll only get in the way. So today, I want to honor this grandma's wisdom and I want to say out loud, I want to acknowledge the fear and the darkness that I and so many of us are holding in this moment. I want to name the pain and then I want to send it on its way because there's important work for us to be doing that it's only getting in the way of. So here's what's keeping me up at night these past several months. This war. This terrible, anguished, horrible war is breaking us. Over winter break, there were fresh waves of grief and horror, not only reading the daily updates, but also reading the story in the New York Times about the most vicious and vile and inhumane acts of rape and sexual assault carried out by Hamas against Israeli girls and women. I read about atrocities that I, who studied international human rights and conflict resolution in graduate school, no stranger to the cruelties and the barbarity that people can inflict upon one another in wartime, I could not breathe or speak or move for hours. And then the paralyzing, gripping realization that my daughters, my children, would read that piece eventually too. And then they would know that such terrible, terrible things could exist in this world. And then the horror and the worry for the survivors and for the families of the victims, what they've endured the struggles that they will all face to ever feel safe in this world again, the reverberative trauma from these reports and all that they reveal about the capacity for human cruelty. And then learning that the article was immediately dismissed as fake news and war propaganda. 
witnessing a mass mobilization to discredit the peace. Beware of open hostility to verifiable reality, warned Timothy Snyder. You submit to tyranny when you renounce the difference between what you want to hear and what is actually the case. The renunciation of reality can feel natural and even pleasant, but the result is your demise as an individual and thus the collapse of any political system that depends on individualism. We heeded Snyder's warning when it was the machinations of the hard right in this country that we were collectively rejecting. And yet today, open hostility to verifiable reality is another just tool of the so-called liberation, as if denying atrocities could ever lay the foundation for a just future. That keeps me up at night. And the hostages. Every night is a nightmare. I hear the families in Hostage Square in Tel Aviv crying out, do not forget us. I hear the family of Naama Levy, who was a teenager when she was taken on October 7th, the great-granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, a participant in Hands of Peace, dedicating her life to working toward peace with Palestinians, a beautiful girl my daughter's age. She's injured, her mother cries out. The days are passing. And every day that passes, it's even harder for her. Time is running out. Time is running out. That keeps me up at night. The terrible human suffering in Gaza keeps me up at night. The parents who are writing their children's names on their legs so that they can be identified if they're killed in a blast. The extinction of entire families, babies in their mother's arms, Children with their parents, with their grandparents, with their great-grandparents, entire lines lost. And an immense fear of what could be catastrophic days ahead. Disease and hunger and hopelessness. That keeps me up at night. The concern of additional fronts opening up in the north. The promise that what we've already seen will be nothing compared to what might come in the future. The prospect of so much more death and so many more broken families and so many more coffins holding 26-year-olds who only want to get a degree and fall in love and raise their children, that, that keeps me up at night. The horror, the horror that the hardline messianic ideology that we have been warning about for years, the voices that we've been decrying and condemning, hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the street week after week since that government took power a year ago, are now the dominant voices representing the Jewish state in the eyes of the world. That keeps me up at night. To hear these extremists calling for voluntary emigration from Gaza, threatening illegal, unjust, immoral, un-Jewish actions to be taken in the name of the Jewish state, to witness the weak need equivocation in response to these threats, even as they cement the worst perceptions of Israel's intentions in the eyes of the world. That keeps me up at night. The reality of our Jewish community in the diaspora, the 100 schools and shuls that received bomb threats this week in California, the fact that many of our children who are here in Los Angeles Angeles were sent home from school this week as their classrooms were cleared out and swept for explosives. The conversations that many in this room needed to have with their five and seven and nine-year-old children explaining why school was canceled. The ongoing trauma of last semester on our kids in college. The concern about their safety when we send them back to school later this month. The disappointment, the outrage over the failure of many of our great institutions to keep our children safe in word or in deed. And the growing undeniable awareness that political forces are now using anti-Semitism as a weapon to advance a far right agenda that has nothing at all to do with keeping Jews safe, but is fueled instead by a desire to delegitimize efforts to build a more just and honest and inclusive America, something that we too have been fighting for for decades. And the knowledge that those efforts only endanger our Jewish community 
and our democracy. That keeps me up at night. All of this adds up to an overwhelming sense of powerlessness. We are witnessing the unraveling of our world. We are exhausted. We are anguished. And with that overwhelming sense of powerlessness, we come here this morning and we open up a new book, Sefer Shemot, the book of Exodus. And here we see the ruthless oppression that our ancestors suffered. We see Pharaoh's growing desperation to the threat that he believed that they posed to his power, the perverse decree that the midwives must murder every newborn Hebrew boy and their courageous thwarting of that command, which leads Pharaoh to charge his people that every boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Our rabbis note, incidentally, that this last decree is not only to throw every newborn Hebrew baby into the sea, but every newborn boy, Hebrew or Egyptian. And the Midrash explains why. Because the astrologers had predicted that the liberator of the Hebrews would be born, but it wasn't clear if he'd be born Hebrew or Egyptian. And in fact, Moses, of course, was both because he was born a Hebrew and adopted by an Egyptian family. So Pharaoh decided that therefore the whole people must suffer a terribly pointed message for us in our time, that it is not possible to pursue an enemy with blind rage without submitting our own people to great suffering at the same time. And then the Torah goes on, the birth of Moses. Vayelach ish mi beit Levi, a certain man of the house of Levi went out and took a wife from the house of Levi. The rabbis in Masechet Sota note the strangeness of the way that this story is told. A man went out from the house of Levi. Where did Amram go when he went out? And their answer, Amar Rav Yehuda Bar Zvina, Shehalach Ba'atzat Bito. He went out according to the advice of his daughter. His daughter Miriam. She was maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven years old at the time. And so spins the Midrash, the story that when Pharaoh made his decree that all of the baby boys would die, all of the Hebrews divorced. Because what's the point of staying married when you might have children and those children might get divorced? But little Miriam confronts her father. Father, she says, your decree is even harsher for the, Jew for the Hebrew people than the decree of Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh's decree only applies to the males. But, but your decree applies to the males and to the females. If you have a girl child, that child would live. But now you're not having any children at all. And then she goes on to say that Pharaoh the wicked, you're assuming that the people will follow and observe his decree. But maybe they won't. Where's the hope, Abba, she says. There are two lessons for us here. Miriam, this brilliant beautiful child in the spirit of the beautiful and brilliant children in our own community, unjaded, unencumbered by the cynicism and the desperation of the adults around her, knows the harshness of the absolutism of Pharaoh's decree, but she assumes that something, something might be done to defy the decree. Think of it. The adults only assume that Pharaoh's words will be followed, but the child sees a crack. Maybe she thinks the Egyptian people will be like Shifra and Pua, the midwives who defied Pharaoh. Maybe they too won't listen. Do you see what's happening here? This child rejects the despair that is born of her parents' sense of inevitability. She detects the hint of a whiff of a possibility that the future might not be as bleak as it appears. And even still, she reasons, even if Things are as bad as we imagine they might be. And the Egyptian population does follow through with this decree. And the worst possible scenario unfolds and all those babies die. Even still, she tells her parents, you must live and you must love. It's because of this that Miriam is called a Nevi'ah, a prophet, because she prophesies that even in the depths of heartache, we have to affirm life. We have to continue to love. This must be the most powerful expression of hope, prophetic indeed. Amram and Yochevet hear their child Miriam, 
And not only do they remarry, they do it with a huge celebration. And little Miriam and Aaron, her little brother, lead the dancing and singing, and the people rejoice. Think of it. They are dancing and singing and rejoicing in the midst of the worst, most humiliating bondage. Surrounded by unyielding heartache, they dance and they sing and they rejoice. How could they? They had to make sure, the rabbis say, that everyone in the Hebrew community saw and heard and knew about the decision that they had made, the decision to live. But that's not all. It's also because when you choose love, you choose love then and now and always. So what keeps me up at night? The terror and the heartache and the sense of betrayal and the disappointment and the moral confusion and the anguish and the fear. And these are all real. But we cannot organize for social change. We cannot live by what keeps us up at night. So I am choosing to say to my fears and to this darkness, I won't be needing you anymore this Shabbos. I have work to do here that you will only get in the way of. And instead, I ask you to turn to one another today and with love to ask each other, what gets you up in the morning? For me, it's this. Thousands of years ago, in a time far worse than this, with a landscape of suffering even bleaker than today, when girls and women were even more marginalized than they are today, one little girl changed the world because she refused to stop living in the face of the threat of dying. She reminded her parents and her descendants, you and me and all of us, that we too can choose to arise each morning to the possibility of new joy, presence, love. This is the hope for a better future. Choose joy. Choose presence. Choose love. Shabbat shalom.